Hi, I'm Eric Ostro. Live with the Lortel is about to start. For season two, while theaters are dark, we are discussing with our guests their thoughts on the reckoning the theater community is facing for systemic racism and their vision for the future of the American theater. To broaden our perspective, I am sharing my platform with co-hosts from the BIPOC community. We offer these conversations to help us learn and to start the healing process. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Ostro. I'm one of the hosts this evening for Live at the Lortel. I'm so happy that you're all here. Um, I'd like to get right into it and bring on my co-host, my very dear friend, John Andrew Morrison. John. Well, hello, Eric. How are you? Well, hello. Darling? Welcome back to New York, my friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. How are you? Where are you? I am, at this moment, I'm in Miami. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I can't really complain. <laughs> a lot of room. I guess that's another story. Anyway, um, I want to get right to our guests uh, because I have so many questions to ask. And I'm so honored. Um, I think he's a magnificent actor. Um, and um, let's just bring him right on. Let's welcome um, Shakuti Awuji. Very good. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I, 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 I love seeing the miniature panic in every presenter's <laughs> face that millisecond before they say my name. There's a deep breath. There's a deep breath and moment of this could be the end of my broadcasting career. And it's hilarious. But you did great. <laughs> you, see, you see how truthful that is because I'm red as a beat right now. And that's exactly <laughs> right. I've been actually, I was rehearsing it all day. It's, uh, it's a beautiful name. Thank you. Um, I'm glad I got it right. Thank you. So much. Well, welcome. Welcome to Thank our show. You. Thank I'm you. such a big fan of your work and your artistry. Let's just get right down. How, how are you? Um, where were you when kind of we, the world shut down and, and well, stopped? Well, when the world shut down, um, it's funny. We, the world was starting to shut down and I was actually in San Francisco because I got married on February 2nd, 2020 literally oh. on the day of the Super Bowl. And a week later, the world started shutting down. So at the beginning of the shutdown, you could say that I was probably hosting the last super spreader of 2020 in my <laughs> wedding. Because <laughs> technically, you know. But uh, yeah, I was in, in San Francisco, which is where my wife and her family are from. And my friends had flown in from Singapore, you know, from... Um, Korea, London, all over the France, all over the place. And of course, everyone from all over the States. So you, we realized that had we, because we thought at one moment, should we delay because it's Super Bowl, but we love the 2-2-2020. We said no. Yeah. And thank goodness, because if we were delayed, um, I don't think a lot of people would have made it. So then we came back to New York and pretty much were March 13th, I think it was, or something. We were in New York, in, a, in Harlem, in our apartment, and uh, weathered the storm pretty much there, you know? What, has it been like an extended honeymoon or has it like you know, they say the proof is in the pudding, right? You know, there's this moment where you get married and you're like, oh, it's just the two of us forever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we it was a real baptism of fire because it's like, oh, we're, we're really going to find out how this works. No, yeah. but it was great. And no, it was we, we planned the honeymoon was supposed to be last summer, you know, and that wasn't going to happen. So we're hoping you know, vaccine allowing and stuff to go for it um, later on this year. My sister lives in Mozambique. She's the British ambassador to Mozambique. And Mozambique is absolutely gorgeous because you from there you can drive to Swaziland, oh. South Africa. And, you know, you could do the safaris and then you can go to the coast also because the coastline is right there. So that's our hope. You know, we'll see how the vaccine rollout goes. But we're planning to try it this year, you know. Oh, was the last amazing. thing that you were working on? Um, I know you, you got married and you were in San Francisco, but did it um, was the last uh, TV thing you were working on? Did it did it shut that down? No, or you had I, finished. I I had literally. It's funny because I very luckily had finished. Literally wrapped. I was doing this film called uh, Mother, uh, that's coming out. I don't know. I guess later on this year, and we literally wrapped end of January. And then I came back from our wedding and I had to go to Berlin for the Berlin Film Festival. And people were still sort of like, yeah, there's this thing going around. It sounds like the cold. But I realized we were in Berlin at the film festival for another film I'd done, um, Shine Your Eyes. Mm -hmm. 
And you think about those festivals and the thousands of people that gather, and we're like, how did we not? I mean, given that we now know it was around for much longer than we thought, you know, I, I feel very lucky. So basically, I was lucky to finish everything I was attached to um, before the shutdown happened. A couple of things I was supposed to do to start right. later on have been postponed and, and, and pushed back and stuff, but I was able to finish everything I'd started. Well, I was just going to ask, and, and where, where are you now? And right now I am in Vancouver, which I've never been to. It's my first time. And we arrived here two weeks ago. And today's the first day post quarantine because they don't mess around here in, <laughs> in Canada. You, know, you arrive and they're all very no. nice with customs. You know, Canadians are very friendly people, but they do make it clear to you in Vancouver that um, if you break quarantine, uh, it's up to three years in prison or a million dollars fine. That's gonna make wow. you. That's gonna make you pay attention, and it's incredible because I mean, I, you know, there's a big shout out to Vancouver. I think they had when we checked last week, only 62 deaths, which is 62 too many, I know, but 62 deaths in the whole period. And I think there was like one person in ICU for COVID, and that's how being rigorous with this thing and and people not seeing it as a violation of their rights to stay safe. You know how you can control something like this and so we got here and we did our quarantine they you know every day you have to fill in an app to say how you feeling and all mm -hmm. that stuff and and the, the the home delivery business is is booming i mean those guys are sure. doing great you know <laughs> like it's a whole different level of delivery from the days of um um domino's pizza i'll tell you that you know <laughs> yeah you can get anything now i mean or gourmet meals to, to anything, domino's, any time of the day mm -hmm. anything you need on top of it and it's fantastic because they know the rules also they know okay we'll bring it to your door then step away you know it's all very it's a new normal for a while you know and yeah. rather than resist it people have found a way to to live with it but today i mean my wife she sleeps in she, she's not a morning person at all i usually get up and and, and save the world before she wakes up. And, um, <laughs> but she was up early today. She was right. She's been doing her research right there. The patisserie that, that's got the great <laughs> ratings, getting takeout coffee, whatever, just getting out there. And it was raining. She was up before me, ready to go. You know, so um, it's great. It's great to be <laughs> connected to the world again. But yeah. So, uh, anyway, your, your question of why I'm here, I am here filming. I'm about to start uh, filming. Uh, James Gunn's new project for HBO Max, um, Peacemaker is how it's commonly known. The actual name is The Scriptures, but it's based, it's a sort of a prequel. He's doing the new P the new Suicide Squad movie. Mm -hmm. And the new Suicide Squad movie, um, one of the characters in it, played by John Cena, is Peacemaker. So this is a, 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 a sort of prequel uh, of his character, uh, TV show for HBO Max. I got here two weeks ago and I, I start filming. Now I'm COVID uh, cleared to start work. <laughs> I am so jealous. I want to do an action movie in the worst way. I think oh, it would be yeah. so much fun. Mm -hmm. And I noticed oh, yeah. on your filmography, on your bio too, that you did John Wick. I mean, like, I know we're here to you talk know, about theater. But like... <laughs> yeah, you, know, yeah, yeah. you know what? No, I have the John Wick thing was. Yeah, because it's John. You know what? The John Wick, Wick story. This is hilarious. I I was late to the John Wick world. I think about six months after it came out, I was in my studio apartment in uh, New York. I don't know, this must have been around twenty fifteen or something like that. And I'm watching, and I just you know I'm saying, let me watch something on Netflix or something. And I see, yeah, I, I always have time for Keanu. I have a bit of time for Keanu. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean so we all I do. Say, oh, this is a movie. Let me watch some Keanu, and it's it's John Wick, and I'm there going. Oh, do you remember the old um, John Woo movies? Like oh, yeah. Hard yeah. Yeah. Hong Kong mm -hmm. noir, you know, with uh, Chow Yun Fat. Yes. You know, the, mm -hmm. the ballet, balletic, <laughs> using a gun like it's a piece of dance. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I'm watching Keanu do this, and I'm like, these guys have completely, they basically did for me, for the hard boiled action Hong Kong noir, they did to that what matrix did to the kung fu movies that we grew up with do you know what i mean is yeah, yeah, bring yeah. it to america bring it to and do it well not yeah. do it well and i'm there and i remember getting on the phone the next day to my um to my agent and my manager you know actually um meg who's still my manager now and i said um you, 
if there's a sequel to this, you have to get me on it. <laughs> and I'm sure she was like, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll just I'll just call and say Chikudi Wuji wants to do your sequel. But yeah. anyway, she was very nice about it and humored me. And then uh, I'm not lying to you guys. It must have been a question of a couple of weeks or something later, maybe a couple of months. And I get a call saying you have an audition for John Wick too. <laughs> and I, uh, I went wow. in there, did the audition. I thought I was brilliant, you know. Um, and they never, it was one of those auditions where it's like they're practically, it seems like they're offering the job on the spot. Mm -hmm. And then I went home and didn't hear anything about it. And it was like three months later, my London agent calls and says, um, there's this role in John Wick and it's the same role I went up for here in the States. And I was like, I've already auditioned for this. She goes, well, clearly we still haven't found the guy. So why don't you just put yourself on tape again? And I put myself on tape the next day I got a call from the Italian, because they were filming in Italy at the time, the casting director in Italy saying the director, Chad Stahelski, wants to have a, a, a phone call with you, um, a, um, a Skype, you know, before Zoom. And literally it was, I sit and we have this Skype call and he just goes, look, you're the guy we've been looking for. Do you want it? We need you on a plane in a week. I was like, I'm there. <laughs> Amazing. But I didn't get to fight. And I'm there watching Keanu Reeves do all oh. these drills. And I'm like, please put a gun in my hand. Put a gun in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> just change it. You know what I mean? I just, I just want to feel like, you know. Like, <laughs> and then before this, and then this is what's funny about this gig is when the breakdown came to me about this character, I'm playing a character called Mern. And I looked at the breakdown and it described him as, you know, serious and tough. And it was like, why don't they just go cast The Rock? Why are they wasting time with me right now? You know what I mean? It's like, and I almost did an audition for it. I was like, you know, I just, I'm at a point now taking myself too seriously. I'm trying to cast myself, which you should never do. Any actors out there, seriously, watching this, get over this. The number of times my manager has said, an agent have said, don't cast yourself if they've come, especially if the casting director knows you. If they've come after you, that means they're looking still. Just and usually when you cast yourself, that's just the actor trying to prepare themselves for failure. You know what I mean? To some say, oh, I'd never be right for this. Yeah. But I almost got in my way with that because I was like, oh god, this is gonna be. They're gonna look for a guy some six foot five muscle guy. <laughs> you know, there's and you know, and then I actually did what you should always do, which is actually read the material. And it's then, it's hilarious. Of course, it's James Gunn. So it's hilarious, it's witty. I immediately knew what I wanted to do with this guy. And that's what I did. I said, take away all that stuff of what you think they want and just bring yourself to it. Mm. And I, I did that and it was the, I did a tape like a week later, they said, loved your tape. Can you just do another scene? They sent another scene. Like a week later, I got a call and it was a straight offer. No test, nothing. James Gunn started. I was like, that's my guy. That's him. That's it. I mean, the biggest, one of the biggest things I've ever had. And it was in many ways, the most straight. Isn't that funny? The irony yeah. of this industry. Yeah. And when again, it's for it, you, it's for you. Yeah. When it's for you. My dad has always told us growing up, what is yours is yours. It's as simple as that. You, you, there is no other logic to it if it's yours nothing's keeping it from you and if it's not yours you can't you can't force it it's not gonna happen you can't make it happen but yeah. the interesting thing is as i was reading uh took a deep dive into your life and career over the uh, over the past week and many roles have come to you that way so mm. um uh, can you tell um the last thing i saw you in was othello at the mm. public theater and i thought you were just magnificent in Thank that role. I loved the whole production from, from start to finish. The whole cast was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I think everybody was on like an even playing field. Yeah. I've never seen Othello done that way. way. Yeah. Um, and can you tell how that role came to you? And um, Yeah, it's, it's you know, I, I always say in shows like this when we talk and bless you for saying what you said, but uh, I always say shows like this always seem like, you know, when you look at a picture album, it's all always smiles. Mm. No one's actually, no one actually talks about the gaps in between the pictures to get you to those smiles, you know, yeah. and what's going on. So yeah, I, I, the Othello is another example of something like this, but I, I'm just very conscious of the, of the, of your viewers and of the journey of, being an artist and how the ups and downs are and to say that although we're here talking about the ups, i.e. the jobs I've done, which is all we can talk about, 
you know, we know the downs and they, yeah. they have to exist. Yeah. They have to exist together. They don't, they're not separate, you know. But Othello was one of those, again, a bit like John Wick. I was, um, I had just come back from London and I had done like, I just worked with Evo Van Hove. I went to London to do Hedda Gabler with Evo Van Hove. Mm. And then while I was there with the wonderful Ruth Wilson and Rafe Spall and all that, and while I was there, um, Evo, on opening night, my, my agent calls and says, oh, Evo wants you to do his next play with Big Law. So do you want to do it? I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so I did it. And so I did back-to-back -back plays. And I'd just come from New York and done Hamlet. So I was a bit played out, you know, as far as plays go. I was doing, and a lot of them, but the big reason why I moved to the States was to do more film and TV. Mm. And then just towards the end of my stay in London, I got this TV thing written by the wonderful Abby Morgan called The Split, mm. um, which is about the world of divorce law. And I loved, and then on the back of The Split, um, I got... Richard Eyre, who's a mentor of mine, Sir Richard Eyre, the great director, he called and said, I'm doing a, King, a film of King Lear with Anthony Hopkins. And they offered me a role straight out of it because I want you in it. And then I did Then I did this film, Shine Your Eyes. I told you I went to Berlin for in, 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 um, in uh, Sao Paulo. So all of a sudden, all this filming, stuff, and I was loving it, loving for the first time in my career, which is longer than I care to admit. I, um, <laughs> I was getting film work and, and, and cutting my teeth on it because practice makes, you gotta do it, you know what I mean, sure. to get better. And so I came back to uh, New York after all that and I was having our year briefing with my manager, Meg, and Meg was like, okay, so what are we doing? And I said, Meg, you know, we've got to stay on this film and TV thing. I've got to do more of it. I've got to get more comfortable with it. Um, and I need to make money. Um, so, <laughs> so, and then, and Meg, and I said, and I literally said to her, guys, this is no lie. I said to her, look, Meg, honestly, unless someone, and yes, and I had agreed already to do The Low Road, directed by the wonderful Michael Greif um, and uh, Bruce Norris's play at The Public. I'd agreed to come back and do The Low Road. And I said, after The Low Road, Meg, that's it. We're going back to the film and thing. I can't turn up this. It's too good a play, too great a venue, too great a director. I, it's going to be so great. But practically, I said to her, unless the public call and offer me, I don't know, <laughs> Othello in the park. <laughs> I literally said that to her. I said, honestly, Meg, that's enough of the theater. Unless the public call and say, hey, do you want to do Othello? A week later, that's exactly what happened. I hadn't even started rehearsing the low road yet. And they came up and said, look, um, do you want to sit down with Ruben? Santiago Hudson, oh. and I, I'm a huge, I mean, admire that man, he's yeah. a legend. And so I went in and I met with Ruben and we spoke for like two hours, just spoke about it, about the history of Othello, how Othello has has always been a vehicle for Iago, right? Yes. You know what yeah. I mean? It's always been a chance for yeah. the up and coming hot or the well-established hot white guy uh, to show how good he is in the most uh, verbose character in the canon at the expense of Othello, who's a side mm. and certainly at the expense of a Desdemona or an Amelia, all these great mm. roles, do you know what I mean? And Ruben wanted, wanted to readdress that, and I wanted to readdress that, because for me, Othello is the greatest love story ever, never written because of the tragedy caused. I think Desdemona and Othello could have been the greatest love story ever, if not for the tragedy. And that's where I wanted to come at it from. I wanted to come out, I said, because look at the structure of the play, guys. The fifth act is the length of the Bible, right? And yeah. he kills her at the beginning of the fifth act. Mm -hmm. So why do people want to sit there for another half hour listening to him if he hasn't earned it? If he mm -hmm. hasn't earned, Jesus, you did wrong. You were fool, but you lost a great thing. You've got to earn that love and he only has a scene and a half to establish that great love story before it all starts you know falling apart so me wow. and ruben are romantics and we understood we understood the politics of it but we said we're not going to focus on the politics the politics is there when in america for christ's sake in 2018 in america mm -hmm. you, you think we need to tell people about the politics of interracial relationships no what we need to deal on is that the the, the tradition 
of this play. How when Ira Aldridge, another character, but I don't know if you've heard of him, was this great American, you know, um, who I'm, I've written a screenplay about, more on that later. But that after Ira Aldridge made Othello as a black man to finally play Othello famous, how all these white performers, Italian, supra, uh, Italian opera singers, everyone wanted to play Othello after mm. Ira Aldridge because he made Othello great. So I'm like, what was it about it that made people think, actually, it's Othello I want to play now? As a white guy, why do I want to come and take away this role and make it mine, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so Ruben, that's what we talked about for two hours. And the next day I got a call saying he wants you. And I was like, great, we'll do it. Because we're on the same page. And this is someone I would trust to take care of me. Just like the reason Ruben hasn't played Othello, which he should have, is because he's never met a director he trusted to take care of Othello in the mm -hmm. room and not make it the Iago show. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I trusted this guy to do that, and it delivered. It's it's one of the hardest. I've always said the greatest role I've ever played is Hamlet, but the hardest role I've ever played is Othello, and it's so rewarding because of that difficulty. You know, that's so interesting. We're gonna get to Hamlet in in a minute because I, I I love the way the public did it with with the yes. mobile. But that's what I was saying before about how I thought it was the first production that I'd ever seen of Othello. I haven't seen that many, but that it was an even playing field yes. that, you know, and the women were highlighted very much yes. in it as well. Yes. And I loved that. It was a real ensemble piece. It is as are most of his plays, practically all of his, we get so, I don't know, we look for shortcuts in life and who can blame, you know, your young director, your up and coming director and this major star is playing Iago. <laughs> The stars guaranteed that um, there'll be butts on the seats. Right. How many people are brave enough to say, okay, I've got that name, but you know, it's about the play, not about him. How many people are brave enough to do that <clears throat> when you've already got a shortcut? You've got a shortcut which says they're all coming to see this guy anyway, or this woman anyway. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it takes that's what one of the things I respected about and also of Corey to Iago, because so generous an actor, Corey Stahl, so generous, didn't come in there thinking this is the show. We we were building a story in which he happens to play Iago. And I think a lot of people saw the play in a different light. I think some people didn't buy into it because they're so used to seeing it in a certain light, the winking and the whatever, and the, 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 the buffoon in the middle of it, just going crazy, mm -hmm. crazy, crazy. The, it was odd for people to see, Jesus, there's a, there's a love story in there, you know? And that's what we wanted. And the design, Rachel's design and Ruben's eye and the colors mm -hmm. and the movement, it was such a sumptuous, it was almost beautiful. You yeah, know, I used I, that I, deliberately. I it was almost beautiful because of the tragedy. Yeah, I would agree. It was yeah. it was the most beautiful production of Othello I've ever seen in my life. And yeah, yes, yeah. I, I, you and Corey together, and the whole cast. It was Heather Lynn. Heather Lynn is there's the moon. I mean, just like <laughs> everyone just brought it and got them and got their highlights. You know, and and I, I just feel that that's what that's what great directors do. They understand. Look, any the actor that says to you, "There's no such thing as small parts. There's only small actors. It's full of shit." That's someone that's only ever played new roles, right? I don't believe that. There are small roles, right? but it takes a special kind of um, director to understand that if I focus on the world of the play, if I focus on the story, as opposed to this person or that person, maybe I'll get something out of this that even those audience members don't know they're going to get, you know? It takes a special and a brave one to do that because it's not flashy. It's 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 messy, actually, like the real life, you know? Yeah, and also Ruben being a wonderful actor mm -hmm. uh, probably right. helped Absolutely. you on both sides of it. He knew what actors needed and he knew what actors don't like to hear and he knew what actors need to hear and and um he was a he was a great director to have for that project really go ahead john you had a question no i'm just struck by the fact like you've gotten to work with so many wonderful people and mm. um 
that is clearly about relationship building um, mm -hmm. and, and how you build relationships and how you show up um, in relationship in a room and with yeah. people. Um, and so I think for um, the young actors out there listening to this, can you talk a little bit about that, about um, how, n n not even how you go about it. Like, I think some of that is just authentic, like you, yeah. you do, but there, I, I, I'm, I'm struck by it. Like you're working with Ivo and you're working with Ruben, like you know, <laughs> you've, you've built like all of these yeah. great partnerships and relationships and how they enrich you and. Yeah, I mean. And wait, wait, before you answer it, I just want to remind yeah. our audience um, to that we are open to at, um, with your questions. So please go ahead and put right. your questions in the chat. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you know, guys, 80% of it is luck, right? Let's let's just put that out there. Let's just put that out there. But that other 20% is, is, is what have you done and what do you do and how do you prepare yourself for when that luck strikes? <laughs> Luck's gonna strike everyone at some point. It's a fact. It's just, you're gonna you're gonna what? Where are you at when that lightning bolt does strike? And I, you know, here's a story. I mean, my father didn't buy his first pair of shoes till he was sixteen, and at that point, he'd already been teaching for like two years. Teaching, he was, and helping raise his seven sisters, younger sisters and younger brother. My mom had to leave school in like sixth grade, despite being top of a class and a super athlete, because she had to help raise her younger sisters and whatever in the village in Nigeria. Yet these two people <laughs> rose up to senior diplomats with the United Nations and put five kids and God knows how many that I, how many um, kids they sponsored and helped through education, the best education possible. They rose that far, doing nothing but working hard, believing their faith, very important to them, but working hard and ethic. So I asked myself, I'm born into this, born into the best schools, born into, I was lucky, you know, born in school, went to Yale. And I asked myself, well, what the hell's stopping me from going as far as I can? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look at the start I got. What the hell is, what the hell is saying I have to have a ceiling of some kind, nothing actually. But I can't control the luck or the timing or the director liking me or the fact I can walk into a room and I remind a director of an ex-boyfriend that <laughs> screwed her over to fuck off. You know, getting excuse me, can I swear on this? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, good, good. Yeah, you know, I, I I can't control all that. What I can control is the first show I did at the RSC in the wings playing tiny parts, watching all the lead actors every night, watching and deciding, okay, if you think you're better than him, why? What would you do differently there? Mm -hmm. Talking to actors that were the city actors at the time that became my friends and mentors like Greg Hicks and whatever going, okay, so in Coriolanus, when you do that, so what are you doing with your breath? Going to extra lessons with Cecily Berry and whatever, it's like just saying, I am going to have everything in my arsenal so that if I'm lucky, <laughs> I'll be ready. And I think that's what performers have to ask themselves is like, yeah, you can sit there and, and go, I'm never getting the opportunities and wallow in that. Or you can ask yourself, what am I gonna do if the opportunity, if someone dropped that on you right now, that uh, can you be ready in an hour for this? The answer should never be, I don't know. It's like, yes. So it sounds a bit preachy, but no, I don't what has helped me guide through the luck is that every time the luck, and if I could go through almost every major job I've done has something divine or, or uh, magical about it. But I can say that every time it's happened, I've been ready. Wow. And I think that's the big thing artists have to learn, you know? I love that. I don't think it's preachy at all. And, and I think yeah. that's a, a great yeah. lesson and, and piece of advice for all the young students that are out there that listen to this podcast. I, I think that's very, very important. When when the time comes and it is your time that you're ready for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanna go back a little bit. Uh, you've done so much with the public, but um, you did a production of Hamlet with mm. their mobile 
it would go around to prisons and um, shelters and schools. And can you talk a little bit about your experience and what that yeah. was like to go to those institutions and the whole, I, I love the whole story about it. I mean, I mean, that's Joe Pat. That's what he founded the public on. And I, I was, a, I was approached by Stephanie Ibarra, whose birthday it is today. Happy birthday, Stephanie, who was in charge of the mobile unit at the time. And I was talking, and at the same time, I was having meetings with Oscar Eustis about what we're going to do next, you know, what, what I'd like to do. And I think I went in to speak to him about doing Coriolanus, but I think Liv Schreiber, someone is tied to do that. I was like, well, you know, I'd pay to go see that, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, um, but Oscar said there might be something brewing. I'll, I'll be in, you know, give me a second. And it turned out that something brewing was the Hamlet, the mobile unit for Hamlet. And of course, when someone offers Hamlet, you just go, yes. I mean, it's one of those roles you say yes, and then think about logistics afterwards. <laughs> because the thing about Hamlet is that it, it, and this was why it worked, is that I don't think as a, if you're, if you're the public and you're, or any theater and you're deciding to do Hamlet and you have a director, you shouldn't be saying, okay, now let's go find our Hamlet. I think Hamlet is one of those roles where you decide this person is a Hamlet and then you make the production happen. It's a, it's, you have to go backwards. It's just one of those roles that if the director doesn't feel that's my Hamlet, you can't manufacture that. You can't hope to find that. You can't hope that if I do enough auditions, I'll find them. And it can't, it can't just be about, oh, let's go. It has to be like, okay, I'd like to do Hamlet with you. <laughs> That's how the conversation should go for a role like that. Um, so uh, Patricia McGregor was up for doing it with me. She was like, yeah, you know. So we just started talking. And I, as she was talking about it, it was around the first round of Black Lives Matter. You know, that first round in 2016. Yeah. That, that almost fire that lit. And um, almost. I was looking at it. I was looking and we were talking about it. And we were talking about how Hamlet is. It's the whole thing about Hamlet is being let down by those people you most trusted and loved, which is essentially the American tragedy as well as the American you know, in the words of, of, of James Baldwin, the American um, triumph has always been in, uh, tied into the American tragedy, which was to make black people despise themselves. You know what I mean? Um, so I was talking to her, I was like, look, I want to do this Hamlet. I can see this Hamlet, but it's important for you to know that I am not American, <laughs> as you know. And this is, uh, let me finish, my point is, there are a lot of actors you could find that this thing, this thing going on now about see me in, as a black man in America, whereas I understand it, I live here and I'm empathetic and I know it. I was born in Nigeria, a country that I own. Mm -hmm. I came to America of my own choice as part of the highest educational institution, Yale. That's why I was here. It was my choice. Am I the right guy? to carry this torch. And if you say, yes, I'll do it, but I would understand if you don't. And she said, yes. She says, the very fact you're asking that question means that you have to be uh, for me, you have to be for me um, the microphone to tell this story. And from the moment she said that, I launched into what to this day, and I've had some amazing theater experiences. It's up. It's it's there's the most up there with the most singularly impactful for me as a person and as an actor doing that show. And the reason for that is the backstory I just gave you. But taking that show to prisons, can you imagine, guys, mm. about to do to be or not to be? And I'm tying a, you know, you know the thing around your arm to mm. shoot yourself up and end it. And I look out in Rikers Prison. And there's a guy, big guy, must be 6'4". He's been watching the show like this the whole time. And then when I go to do this and go to be or not to be, he just goes, don't do it. Don't do it. This is a guy that might not see the light of day again. Yeah. And that's all on the rooftop of this prison in Manhattan. It was 95. It had to be over 100 degrees easily. And all these guys in their jump, you know, orange jumpsuits were doing that. And Claudio, Claudius has, 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 has betrayed me. 
And I'm, I'm there going, should I do it now? Should I do it now when he's there kneeling and I'm behind him? And these guys go, no. And then uh, a women's homeless shelter, one of the first shows we did, it was a homeless shelter. And I started to be or not to be. And a woman from the back said, that is the question. Where did she, where did she, somewhere, high school, I don't know. Whatever her history was, she knows that line. She knows that speech. So that show, doing finally playing Hamlet in that environment with, with a raw immediacy and communion that you will never, I'm sorry, get in a, in a um, theater going audience. You just can't. They, it, and it's not to blame anyone. It's just not their experience. They're not in jail. They're not in a, in a cell looking for freedom, asking questions. Of how do I get here? How did the system let me down? How did, the, how did I let down the people that love me? How did I kill that person? Till you've done Hamlet and who asks himself all those questions to people that have asked them and are living that question, you've never done Hamlet. Mm. So by the time we brought that back to the theater and you're doing it for the regular audience, the ghosts of all those guys we've done the show with on the road came into the room and it was the most electric, wow. most electric. And I've done a lot of shows, I can't count them, but I, I, can, I can tell you it's the first role I've ever played that I, A, I want to play again, or B, that by the end of the run, I felt there was so much more I still wanted to do with it. So, and that's because of that communion, you know? <laughs> yeah. What I loved about it, um, the concept of it is that it really mirrored what was going on it, it, at, in 2016 with when the Black Lives Matter thing started. But um, can you imagine now? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit? And, and John, I know you had some questions about that. So why don't yeah. you go, please? Well, I mean, you know, talking about that moment here, I'm just very curious as to what, how is that playing out in the UK? You know, mm -hmm. and, and what is the temperature on the ground there with that? You know, like I always kind of go, oh, the UK is much more Quaint. Open, to, <laughs> open to that. And I'm like, mm, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's not. I mean, I, you, that, right? you know, you, you saw the riots, you know, uh, yeah. see George Floyd. You saw the, the, the marches, not riots, that's what people want to call them, but the marches and the protests in London, in Paris, yeah. in Berlin. Yeah. Yeah, um, the, UK has, been, the UK has been doing it longer. You know, <laughs> the Europe has been doing it longer, several centuries longer than in America. So it has found a way of being more institutionalized and more subtle, but just as just as insipid and just as dangerous. And I think the the weakness. I guess it came as less of a surprise in America because it's so in your face. Mm. But the impact was just as powerful in Europe. And I think people were surprised that, wow, I I I, I didn't know. <laughs> you know, I think in I think in Europe there are a lot of people that genuinely didn't know they might be prejudiced. Because it's so in it's like when I was in school and I was I was the first head boy of my um school that that's like your school president first mm -hmm. black one, mm -hmm. first black one you know? yeah. and 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 some one of the governors comes up in complete sincerity and says the way you speak english wow you know what i mean that's 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 what i'm talking about you know it's a complete yeah. lack of awareness that here in the states the rawness of it the immediate the immediacy of it I don't think you can pretend to be that naive here in the States as, as, as generations have taught people in Europe to be naive. You, you don't have that luxury of time here to be that naive, you know? And it's weird for me because I, I come from Nigeria and, and then you go from Nigeria to England with its weird thing, but I'm, you know, sort of in a, this yeah. elite place in England, you know, and, and then you come to America and then I go to Yale. So I'm not, you know, I'm not going South. I'm at, you know, this, you know, I'm in right. liberal, you know, and then I moved to New York and then I moved to London. It's, 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 it's very easy for me to see how people don't clock it because yeah. you're really moving around with people who don't, would never consider themselves that. And for the most part, a lot of them aren't. Let me just put that here is that 
some of the most open, beautiful, genuinely honest people I've met in my life I've met in America. So let's just like get that out there. Mm -hmm. But those circles are the ones that are, are, are most surprised when they find, oh my God, I had prejudice. Because mm. they're supposed to, right? You know? Yeah. But till you address it, till you actually say, do you realize what you just said? Some people genuinely think they're the most open until you address it, you know? Yes. When, Is there, I mean, what's your hope going forward with, with, all of the reckoning and 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 what are the steps? What are the actions that are happening there with like the we see you or you know all, yeah any I mean, of that. before COVID there was necessary and big steps being taken towards redefining appropriation right <laughs> there were a lot of steps going forward with saying what does it mean to really support this black artist in this theater what does it really mean to have a black season what does mm. it really you know how, how far are you willing to really delve into opening this up is it just the performers that we start opening it up to people of color all color you know or are we gonna start opening up at the people who decide the season mm. Or is it just the talent? <laughs> what about the executive, the board members and stuff? And also on our part is like, we I think minorities and stuff have become a bit jaded about these institutions. I mean, there are, I'm sure there are a lot of theaters that would like to invite, but people are like, why am I gonna join your institution? It's so white, you're only gonna go do another season of Noel Coward. Or worse, you're only gonna go do another season of Shakespeare because Shakespeare, for, from the time people, kids of color were little, has been something that belonged to white people. Mm. It's been something that belonged. Juliet can only be blonde. If you're Latina, you're probably gonna get the nurse if you're lucky. <laughs> so there is this whole thing that um, the conversation had started. And I think I hope that with the relief of post COVID and vaccines and getting people back in the seats, we don't go back to where we started. Right. And that we keep that thing going on. You know, James Baldwin, I keep coming back to Baldwin and because we'll talk about it, but I'm attached to play him. And one of the things that Baldwin, you know, he says the poet is called to defeat all labels and challenge all battles. No, to defeat all labels and complicate all battles, he says, you know? To bear witness as long as the faith is in him, as long as the breath is in him, to that mighty, unnameable, transfiguring force which lives in the soul of man. And I feel that, and to aspire to do his work so well that when the breath has left him, the people, all people, who search for a sign of him in the rabble will find him there. We've got to challenge everything. Wow. That's what we do as artists. And as long as we have the faith <laughs> and as long as we have the breath, we will be able to leave our fingerprints in everything we do, you know? So I think the journey forward to Ansi John is that I, 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 I genuinely think that the time is now because I don't know which comes first, the chicken or the egg. You know, does does the revolution on the streets come before revolution on stage, or does because mm. of the stage things happening? I don't know which comes first. But right now, there's something happening. <laughs> it isn't the. It isn't. It, we've had so many false starts, but there's something definitely happening, and so it's time to leave our, you know, to bear witness. Is it as? Baldwin would say it's time to bear witness with the work and we we have to see if this establishment, the established ones, are ready to open up for, to put their money where their mouth is because there's so many artists ready to take on that mantle. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. so I, I just think that, you know, just as we hope this latest round of Black Lives Matter means something legislatively and all that stuff, we can hope that this latest round of awareness in theater isn't just a flash in the pan either. You know, that's yeah. my hope. But I definitely think that, um, as Baldwin said, I, I, I definitely aspire to do my work so well that when the breath has left me, the people and all people who search for a sign of me in the rabble will find me there. That's my part.
You know what I mean? Yeah, I think John and I, I, I agree there. And I don't think there's any turning back now either. I think no. we are, there is a, a fire burning and it, it, it's, the fire is high. So, it's, it's, it's so high and it's so aware and it's so international now. It's mm. actually been embraced in a, such an international way, you know, that I, 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 you know, Walt Whitman, I mean, one of the, the wonderful um, Eddie Glaude, whose book, uh, Begin Again, Mm -hmm. on James Baldwin is the, you know, we just got the rights to it for this TV show of Baldwin that we're doing. Um, he mentions how Walt Whitman, uh, you know, talks about how there was a, the, the, those false dawns after the revolution, you know, and, and there was one after the revolution about, then there was one after the civil war. And then, there were, you know, he talks about, are we going to do that again? Have another false dawn? Because don't forget, it was supposed to be Obama. You know, mm -hmm. before that it was supposed to be 19, before that it was supposed yes. to be 19, it was supposed to be 1968. You know, there was you know things yes. have moved along, but that thing hasn't happened yet. Um, yeah. And that is that false dawn. Post racial America. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about the Baldwin project, or it's, it's yeah, no, no, it's 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 um the wonderful and producer friend again when I was doing, <laughs> when I was doing John Wick. So I flew over to Italy to do John Wick, right? <laughs> so on the first day of filming, uh, my first day of filming uh, is with Common, you know. So Common comes out of his trailer, and I say, "Hey, we say how you doing?" And then he looks at me and he goes, "Man." You remind me of James Baldwin. I was like, oh my God. Because for year, for the last two years I've been in New York, people on the street would stop me and go, has anyone told you you can't <laughs> like in the subway, this woman, I remember this woman in New York in the subway getting off the train and just going, James Baldwin. I was like, <laughs> what the hell is going on? And so Common says that to me. So I call this producer friend of mine, Erica Motley. I said, Erica, What's this thing about James Baldwin? Because I he doesn't he hadn't at that point traveled much beyond America as far as my education in England. Hell, he hadn't been featured much in the education here in the States, period. Yeah, yeah. Um and she flipped because she's a huge Baldwin fan. So on that day, which was January 2016, she started and we started putting the plan together to doing a mini series, a limited series of James Baldwin, and it's taken that amount, we've got Sarah Green, the wonderful producer who did Tree of Life and all that stuff. She's our producer. We've got the wonderful um, Bradford Young, who's the cinematographer, Ava DuVernay, who did, you know, When They See Us and Star Wars. Like Bradford is on, but he's a huge Baldwin, Baldwin fan to to direct. Um, I'm attached to play it. And, you know, it's, 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 it's and then we got the, the rights for uh, Eddie Glaude's, um, begin again with book on which we're basing it on. So that's wow. very exciting because, you know, there's thousands of us out there, guys. I hate to, it sounds, it, it feels like, it feels weird to say it given how much more demand there is than there is supply in our line of work. But ultimately there, there, there's so many of us, so many of us doing projects at one time lots of projects that are great, that will give a lot of joy to people and excitement and you'll make a living and it's great. But it comes back to that thing about my parents again. You go, okay, I, I can I can work, I can work. I'm at a point now where I'm not worried about working. I'm not worried about the next job. What the hell am I doing here? Mm. You know, you go, what? Why am I allowed to work? Why have things aligned in the way to allow me to do? Is it is it is it just to work? Or is it a chance to 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 create a rabble that's worth sifting through later on. Does that make sense? Yeah, and what do you want to say? Project, projects like Baldwin, and um, I've written a screenplay about Ira Aldrich that we're looking to develop. I mean, these are things, they all go hand in hand with what I'm doing here with James Gunn. They all go hand in hand. This is a dream. I, I mean, the kid in Lagos, Nigeria, that grew up staring at a, at a trying to move a teacup with the force because I'd watched Star Wars, <laughs> is very happy to be here in Vancouver about to do a DC yeah. Marvel thing. Don't get me wrong. It's not all about just, but you got to ask yourself, what, what, why you? And what do you want to do? Mm. And so when you ask those questions, 
those are the questions that stop you from from um, settling. You know, they're the questions, and you might not, it's the journey, right? You might not get there. Baldwin might not get made. Something gets in the works. Ira might not get made. But my God, you, it's the journey, right? You, unless you do it, <laughs> unless you try to do it, it's never going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's all very exciting. Very, it's an exciting time, definitely. Well, uh, do you want to float that question that came through? Because I think it's a perfect yeah, segue. Yeah, yeah. Um, what no. inspires you as an actor? What inspires me? From the audience, yes. What inspires you as an actor? I was lucky enough. I could have, there were a lot of things I could have done. Ask my parents, asking me what I want to be growing up. There were a lot of things I could have done. I got a degree in economics from, I could have gone at Yale. I could have done several things. I, there was a time I loved that vet. I wanted to be a vet. There's so many things I could have done. What inspires me as an actor is that, is that kid in Lagos, that my games, the games I played as a kid were not imaginary games. The games I remember playing as a kid were reenactments of things I'd seen on TV. Hmm. That scene from Star Trek, that scene from Superman, that scene from whatever. And then you find yourself, you're going through the, you're doing your stuff and your head is buried in the here and the now and the work and getting the next job and the temp jobs in between the job. And then you get a gig and then you work with this star. And then one day you're working with Tom Hanks. I saw, him big. I, saw, I saw him in big in the suburbs of Lagos jumping on a piano. Or the next day you're, 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 you're doing King Lear with Anna Benning. Oh my God. Or the next day you're, I mean, you just, and, and then you're sitting down next to Anthony Hopkins and you're, you're, you're doing a speed run of Hamlet to be or not to be just for fun with Anthony Hopkins. And he's calling you on your phone because he's just heard, he called me on my phone. It was 8 a.m. in the morning in New York. So 5 a.m. in LA. The announcement had just gone out. I was going to play Othello. He called me to talk about Othello. 45, I'm on the phone for 45 minutes with Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, guys? When you talk about what inspires you is, is realizing you're allowed to dream. That's what, that's what inspires me. You're allowed to dream. Oh, we have a uh, <laughs> beautiful answer. We have one more from the audience. Um, what do you like most about working in theater versus TV and film? Theater is, <laughs> is the, how do I not, not, it's, there's no, can I do a second take? <laughs> <laughs> there's something that happens. I like to get to the theater at, at least two hours before curtain. And I'll spend an hour of that, hour and a half of that just, warming up and stretching and running through my lines and walking through the space and the noise with the realization that in about, you know, 90 minutes, it's going to be packed full of strangers and they're all here to see you. <laughs> and that, you know, once you get on stage and start, you have to stay on the train. There's something. And then something like that Hamlet thing I said happens where you're speaking and you know, every single one is with you for that two hours. You can't get that in film and TV. Film and TV, the magic of it is like we just described what inspires me about it. And mm. you do a take and then you watch it later and you're like, oh my God. And you're like, it's 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 amazing. And there's the, the, the minutia, you know, like you can do, that's all that. But there's something about live theater that that it's that they're there and you can hear the buzz of the audience over the tunnel. You're, you're in your dressing room and you're, you can hear them. Mm -hmm. They're there. They made a point to come there that night after work or, or, or flew in or whatever. They came, they made a point of that to come see that. And then you start and then you have to almost forget all that. And then it's that immediate communion, which there's just no other way. You can't manufacture that 
on a camera. And there's other things you manufacture a camera that I friggin' love. I love being able to just speak like this and not think of projecting. <laughs> I love being able to know that it's gonna come at this angle and this angle and we can play around with it. I know there's takes, there's so many beautiful, and then in, the fact that it's on, it's captured on film, like you are now part of that history on film. There's things that, you know, but the immediacy and the communion of theater, it both terrifies you and it invigorates you. And mm. unless, it's, mm. unless it's your home, unless it's your home, I completely get why people don't want it and hate it and are scared of it. And, <laughs> but if it's your home, if it's your home, you get it, you miss it, you want it, you know. Yeah. It's like yeah. electricity. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. Actual feeling of it. Um, yeah. Um, I could sit and talk with you for um, hours. Uh, and I feel like this 55 minutes has, has, has flown. Yeah. Well. Wow. 50, it's been 50. Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, but I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm, um, I'm a very big fan. Um, I, I, I think your work is just beautiful and precise and um, you're a real chameleon of some sort. And I, I can't wait to see what, what you do next. Thank um, you so much. But I, I want to also let our audience in just a few minutes, the Lucille Lortel Theater is presenting uh, episode one of Consequences series called Ase. And we'd love for you to join us for this free event. Uh, please go to thelortel.org and follow the links to watch live on YouTube tonight at eight o'clock. Um, but with that, I say goodbye to our esteemed guest. I thank, thank you again from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, John, for being yeah. my host again today. <laughs> it's, um, the only word I can say is, uh, you know, it felt electric to me. And I've learned, yeah. I've learned so much. Um, I, I just love that this Nigerian boy has become a citizen of the world. <laughs> and, I, and I can't wait to see all of the other little boys that you inspire to become citizens of the world. This was absolutely fantastic talking Incredible. with you today. Thank you so thank much. You so thank much. you. Thank you to our audience. Um, we're back uh, next week at 7 p.m. with Krista Rodriguez. So we hope we see you then. And um, good night, everybody. Thank you for joining. Good night, guys. Thanks for having me. Take care. Stay safe. Good night. Good night.